Hey everybody, it's Rob Tiffany. I want to spend a little bit of time today kind of giving you a digital twin jumpstart. Um, some of you may know what a digital twin, some of you may never have heard of it. At a high level, it's just a digital representation of a physical object. That physical object could be a machine, it could be an environmental system, it could be a person. Uh, digital twins are typically at the heart of any kind of IoT platform system uh, that may run kind of at a core level in a cloud or data center or at the edge near machines or where things are happening. Um, digital twins are also a critical underpinning of giant megatrends going on right now, like Industry 4.0, representing giant machines and factories or bullet trains and stuff like that. Uh, it also is an underpinning for things like uh, digital transformation. You know, might, you might be digitally transforming the business uh, processes of a big corporation. Uh, digital twins will represent processes, uh, roles that are filled by people, what they do, uh, connected by APIs across departments, uh, how they interact with each other and vendors and things like that and supply chains. So um, super digital stuff. Uh, I'm going to just kind of get you started on how to get going with them. Luckily, I've had the pleasure of designing and building IoT systems with digital twins at their heart, you know, things like Lamada and Hitachi, uh, Vinlink, real-time data. I got to help with the architecture of uh, Azure IoT, and most recently I've been designing and building uh, the Moab platform for nonprofits and NGOs. So anyway, getting started with a digital twin, I need to create a model first. Uh, and you're probably wondering, what the heck's a model? Um, kind of like a model plan, right? So let's just take an example that everyone can understand. Let's talk about a car. So right now I'm sitting in a car. It's a Volvo XC60. So that's my thing that I want to make a twin of. But I could have a fleet of these XC60s, and I don't want to create maybe thousands of individual twins with all these properties over and over again, you know, attributes about them. So what I'm going to do is I need to go one level above and kind of create a model at a higher level, uh, you know, at a class level, an asset class. Basically, what I want to do is I want to go up and say, I'm going to create a model of a generic Volvo XC60, and then the instances, the thousands of them may be in the fleet, will kind of inherit from the things I talk about and define at the model level, at the higher level. So, you know, I'll define things like tires, and tires have pressure, right, PSI, and uh, you'll have the engine, and you'll have transmission, and you'll have RPMs, and air conditioning, and all kinds of systems, right, and subsystems. All those things need to be modeled. So how do I model those? So at this high-level, generic level, uh, you know, kind of that asset class level, I'm going to keep it simple here. So maybe I'll define, uh, I'll define left front tire and right front tire. And I might do, uh, I might say I'm creating an attribute, the, the, it's the XC60 and I want to do one for right front tire pressure. And we know that, you know, maybe the pressure is supposed to be around 32 PSI. Um, there's extra descriptors you need to add in there that is going to help downstream analytics know what's coming. Because uh, a stream of data is going to come in. Maybe it's formatted as JSON and it's being posted, you know, over the web, HTTP, you know, or something else. Uh, the protocol doesn't matter as much as, uh, you know, the data that's coming in. So I'm going to define left front tire pressure. That'll be the name. And that name's going to match up with maybe a name, a label of the data in a JSON file, which is basically a glorified text file with name and value pairs in it. Um, but in order to help the analytics know what to do with it or KPIs what to do with it, I need to say what data type it is. So I might just say it's an integer. Maybe it's not going to have a decimal place. And if it did, I might say a float, you know, or something like that or a double. The integer is just a whole number, right? So I might say left front tire pressure and the type is integer. And then I needed to specify unit of measure because the analytics might say, great, I know it's some kind of number, and I know it's some kind of thing you've called it pressure, but what's it all about? So I'll say unit of measure, and the unit of measure is pressure. So I'm measuring pressure. Um, uh, and then you, you kind of roll that all together, and that's that, that creates kind of a dynamic property. And so you can imagine me going through and creating properties like that for each tire for pressure, maybe for tread thickness, uh, engine wear, oil, you know, ball bearings, all kinds of zillions of things, right? You create all these things, you give them names, you give them a data type, and you give them a unit of measure. And these are for your dynamic properties. You may also create properties for your thing, your digital twin. They might just be 
kind of static, you know, permanent, you know, physical characteristics of that thing that maybe don't change much. You know, you might say the car is however many feet long. You might say, uh, tell what its serial number, who the manufacturer is. Um, lots of kind of static information about it that you want to know. Uh, the other type of property you may have is what I would call uh, either, you know, a virtual property or a calculated property. Uh, which means there's not a one-for-one -one mapping from a physical thing inside the car to the digital thing. It's one that we're going to create. We're going to do a calculation to infer that. A good example of that would be like when you're driving miles per hour. The, how do you get to miles per hour when you're driving a car or kilometers per hour? Uh, the car doesn't really know. But you're, you're pushing on the accelerator, which is an actuator, by the way, um, and it flows fuel in or electricity in. And it's used, depending on what gear it in, you're in, it spins this RPM, this revolutions per minute uh, on your engine. To, and, and so basically the speed that you're going is a function of the gear that you're in and the revolutions per minute and the drag for maybe the road and wind. And so a calculation is done dynamically to tell you how fast you're going. Well, that's an example of like a virtual property. So I might be pulling from real things in real time, like I just described, and I'll just do a calculation in real time to tell you how fast you're going. So that would be like a virtual property. And there could be all kinds of those all there. So that's kind of how you define the model of that system. And then when you actually have all the instances of your Volvo XC60s, then you know they will all inherit these properties uh, one time. So you don't have to keep adding it in over and over and over again. And then, like I said, you'll start capturing data in real time uh, from the actual vehicles. So data will be flowing in for all these telemetry data points. And as they flow in to your system, since you've defined what your car looks like and all its aspects, then downstream analytics and KPIs will know what they're interacting with. So other things that you could add to this model for your digital twin is you could say, well, I want to define some KPIs in advance that are tightly assigned to this left front tire pressure, you know, because maybe the ideal pressure is 32 uh, PSI. So you might do KPIs, you know, uh, uh, it, which is a key performance indicator. And this is real simple stuff, you know, where it's kind of yellow, red, or green, you know. So if I'm in the green zone, you know, there might be a high and level, low threshold kind of just above and just below 32 PSI. Uh, and then there's a yellow when it's getting further away, either the pressure is dropping a lot or it's getting too much. And then red is when you're either got a flat tire or maybe your tire is about to explode. So you define those KPIs in the same model where you define all the other stuff I just told you about with the units measure and everything. And then you also can then have that triggering mechanism so for appropriate analytics. Uh, and again, I'm just still talking about simple stuff right now. So data flows in, there's like a JSON document, it arrives, that event triggers that it arrived, and, it, and then your automatic analytics looks at it and then looks at the definition you created and says, oh, I know this data point is called left front tire pressure. And it's an integer, so it's a number, and it's type of PSI. And I also know that the KPI for this, for, for green, is right around 32. I'm gonna look at that definition just with my simple analytics when I'm triggered to see, hey, what's the number? And then I'm gonna compare it to the KPIs and that's gonna tell me if it's red, yellow, or green, right? Um, and then from that, I can make decisions. I can fire an alert. You know, if I'm in the red zone, I might need to do an emergency alert. I might, in some rare instances, depending on the system we're talking about, send a command back to the machine automatically. You know, do, use this for automation to maybe slow down or stop the car. You know, maybe you're driving with a flat tire and somehow you don't know about it. But my real-time uh, telemetry tells me, comp you know, comparing with what's going on in the digital twin. So it lets me do that and I'll, sh I'll slow things down. How would I do that? I might send a command to the engine to slow down the RPM and then maybe lower gears automatically. I'm just making this stuff up, but you know, just to kind of give you an example. Other aspects of a digital twin is that you'll have that latest data and, it, and this thing will be fully automated You'll also have historical data to see, you know, how things changed over time, what's normal, what's not normal, kind of gives you the history of the machine or the process or the person. Um, you can also put in manual events that you may want to add in the history of the twin. Um, 
Because a digital twin ultimately is telling you this long-term story, right? It's telling you the story of this this machine, this person, this role that they're doing, whatever it is, this process, this assembly line. And so you might put in manually <clears throat> uh, when service was performed on the vehicle, for instance. And so you might put in a date and say oil was changed and, uh, you know, brakes were replaced, you know, uh, fans were, fan belts were replaced, you know, things like that. And so you'll put historical stuff in there and you might put that in manually. And so ultimately though, this creates this, the history and the story of this thing. And that's how this digital twin comes to life. Um, the digital twin is a replacement for your owner's manual, basically, uh, except it's a living thing. Also on the flip side, not only is the digital twin doing all this great stuff I'm telling you about, but it also lets you perform simulations. So once you've created the twin and you've got KPIs and you've got built-in triggering and analytics to do stuff and take actions, you could feed fake data into your system digitally. You know, you could, you could fit it and then see how the system reacts, right? And so if we'd done something like I just described, you could feed in information saying that the left front tire is at 10 PSI. And it'll look at the KPI, it'll trigger an event, it might send a command, it'll do things, and it might slow digitally try to slow down a car. You know, of course, this might all be a fake simulation. But the cool thing is, is you can see how your system will react by sending it fake data through a simulation. So a digital twin has great value after the fact with a living machine. And again, you can apply this to just about anything. And it has value to simulate what will happen. And then the next layer after this is you've got automation, you've got triggering, you can start to layer in more and more advanced analytics over time. You know, there's that kind of the notion of real time analytics that's kind of running hot and you're doing things in the moment. But then you may want to save all this data to do more batch analytics where you're looking back historically, and you might be using, you know, some machine learning, some deep learning uh, algorithms, uh, you might just be doing big data analysis, you know, whatever is appropriate. So look for needles in a haystack and see bigger trends maybe that happen over time uh, that could give you some insight, stuff that may be just not readily apparent to the human eye. Um, so hopefully you got the message here that there is just tons of value in the digital twin. It's another way of looking at how you would model a system. It's a different way in how you do analytics. Instead of just having separate analytics, it's just looking at a stream of bits and doing its thing. What I'm describing to you is kind of all fully integrated all together inside this twin uh, to tell you the history of this machine, this process, this person, and automating it and simulating it. Uh, so hopefully this gives you a good idea of how some of these works. I know not every system has digital twins, but it's something you should look at because uh, I think it's a critical element of any IoT digital transformation or industry 4.0 effort you might be doing. Thanks for your time. I'm out.